Hey, good evening. It's good to be back at Cedar Grove this uh, Wednesday night, and uh, we want to welcome those that's online and those that's in here with us. And uh, we just pray that uh, uh, God will use our time together tonight to help us to to uh, be more Christ-like. So we're going to be back in First Peter again tonight, chapter four. Going to try to deal with a a larger section. I've got uh, there's two paragraphs here. Uh, that I have notes for, and we're going to try to deal with both of them, but we'll see how that goes. So starting in verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, For for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the, the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And so the, the, the whole, this whole first paragraph here is having a Christ-like attitude. This is the first six verses. Maintaining proper conduct when we're suffering requires Christians uh, to have a right Christ-like attitude. Uh, a little quote I have here: "Living in the present, in the will, in God's will. Living in the present, in God's will." And so, if we're suffering, and we talked about this a little bit last week and the week before, but if we're suffering, and we're suffering for Christ, now we're not suffering because I'm just a stick in the mud, or I'm a Fuddy duddy, or I got my own rules, or whatever. But, but I'm suffering for, for the cause of Christ. I'm I'm trying to be Christ-like. I'm, I'm I'm conducting myself like He would conduct Himself. I'm being gentle like a dove and wise like a serpent. And and people are still persecuting me, or things are still happening to me. Well, when when that's happening. I can be assured that I'm in God's will, and so I live the present in God's will, and that's that's a that's a that's a hard thing to do. And and the other side of that is knowing that we're going to live in eternity in His presence. So I'm living presently in His will, and I'm going to live eternally in His presence. And so that allows me, that gives me hope, that gives me strength to go through what I, I'm doing. Verse one, therefore, as much that's a, that's almost the word therefore. <laughs> Peter referred back to Christ's suffering. It goes all the way back up into into chapter three. Uh, look at verse eighteen. For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. All right, so he's taking it back up to that, and and we're to apply those principles of having endurance uh, when we're unjustly suffering. All right. He exhorted believers, Peter that is, to arm themselves. Look at verse 1. For in much then as Christ had suffered uh, for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Look at it. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That word mind there, does anybody have a different translation by chance? That word mind right there is attitude. The the word also means attitude. Let me give you, it's used 83 times in the New Testament in different forms, okay? But uh, in the different forms, it has these meanings or some of these meanings. Resolve, so you, you, you arm yourself with the same resolve. You arm yourself with the same purpose. You arm yourself with the same disposition. I think that's really important. Or the same thought. Okay, so when you're having the same mind, that that all of those words are, are synonyms with that. To to have the same disposition as Christ had. To 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 to, to have the same kind of thought process. Okay. Um. To have that mindset uh, when it comes to to suffering. The word translated arm uh, is the same idea of a a soldier putting on his armor, the same idea that's over in Ephesians 6, uh, 
take to yourself the whole armor of God and to put it on. Uh, when, when you, we, we were talking prior to turning on the video, uh, when Ukraine was expecting uh, Russia to come into it, how do you think those people prepared themselves? Do you think they said, well, you know, I'll put my flip flops on, you know, and, uh, you know, I might, I might get me some bullets, I might not. No, they, they were diligent. You know, they, they took great care. You know, if they had bulletproof vest, I guarantee you they would get them on. If they had a helmet, they would get them on. They were taking great care to arm themselves and to equip themselves as they were getting ready to do battle. Okay. Well, we're in a battle too. We're in a spiritual battle. And we're to, to take the same kind of care to arm ourselves. Arm ourselves here in between our ears. We, we, don't, we don't think about that a lot of times. The, the fights, the struggles we have every day, and if you're like me, all day, the struggles that we have are spiritual warfare more times than not. It's, it's, it's the things are happening in this bombardment. It's, it's, it's amazing how it's amazing how it seems like every human being that cannot drive an automobile gets in front of me. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's like you're riding down. Well, Anita and I, uh, this, this afternoon, we were getting ready to go get something to eat. And I pulled up to the end of the road and I started out and there's a car comes that you can't see coming out of our road. There's a car coming out of the curb. And as the car come out of the curb, I just stopped and I backed up. We took the car 30 minutes to get by us. I mean, it was Fred Flintstone, you know. And so then we pull out. We're behind them all the way up to Ashbury, you know. And, and it just seems like, and you say, well, that's not spiritual. Yeah, it is because Satan knows. That's one of the things that just drives me ape. It drives me crazy, and he knows it, and he gets my goat every day. He does. I'm telling you, he gets my goat daily. But we need to arm ourselves with the right mind because we're in a spiritual battle, folks. The, the, the things that you think is... I heard somebody... Uh, I don't remember who I was listening. I think it was Chuck Swindoll the other day. I was, I was working on something, and I was out in the building, and I had the radio on, and he said, you can control your attitude. He said, let me prove it to you. You and your wife are in a heated discussion. Rawr, 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 just on and on at each other, just eating each other to life. And the phone rings, you pick it, hello? Oh, yes. Yes, that's lovely. And then you put the phone down and it's right back. Rawr, rawr, rawr. We can control that. And we need to understand, we need to understand that day-to-day -day routine. That day-to-day -day routine that we go through. Satan is an anthropologist. And he knows what's going to hurt our testimony. He knows what's going to hurt our relationship with Christ. He knows, he knows. He drags us down. Day, he does to me, and I'm sure he does to you. I am like that, that proverbial fish that's sitting there. And I see the hook, and I'm going, you know, I, I, I know it. I know it. And uh, anyway, let's move on. It's the same idea to, to put on the armor of God. Um, and, and we're to have a, uh, an unsavoring uh, way or unswavering way uh, of resolve to put on God's will. Okay? The same idea, that, that word thought, is found over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Does anybody know what that verse says? Let's go look at it. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It's the same, the, the same words used over here. It's just one book back or two books back. Are you there? 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Same word right there. And, and so your thoughts is down inside of you. It's part of that emotional makeup that we have, and it's, it's part of what drives us. We're going to have to go if we're going to get very far tonight. All right. Uh, identification, uh, identification with Christ or arming ourselves with his attitude also means sharing in his sufferings or his death. Christ suffered in his body, and a believer suffers in his body also. Um, so, so let me ask you. We've all talked about people being sick and hurt in our in our immediate family or in our our little realm of, of influence tonight. Is that kind of suffering? Is that the kind of suffering it's talking about here, or is it something else? Yeah, it's not that kind of suffering because that's that's from our fall, isn't it? That's just that's just sin in and of itself. Uh, the kind of suffering that Christ suffered, He didn't suffer because He was a sinner. Okay, He suffered on the behalf of other sinners. Sinners made Him suffer. You know, they they tried to give Him a hard time whenever He was preaching or teaching. You know, or they were always challenging Him. There was always this. So so He suffered at their hands like that. Well. As Christians, we suffer like that too. You know what I'm saying? We suffer like that too. Um, one of the things that I believe, and I heard somebody just recently say this as well, I think one of the reasons that we keep our mouths shut so often is we're afraid of getting hit in the nose by people's words. You know? Well, we might not, they might, they might not like us. They might whatever, you know, and they just attack us for what we're saying. Um well, let them attack. I seen, I seen, a, I got behind a, a woman today, coming out of High Point. She had a sign on the back of her car. What would Buddha do? Well, Buddha died. I don't, I don't care what Buddha done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What would Buddha do? Yeah, he, he. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Most of them say no. <laughs> um. This idea of suffering, we actually dealt with it back in Romans. Uh, our, well, we dealt with it a little bit in Romans 8 last week, uh, this past Sunday, but we'll deal with it even uh, greater this coming Sunday. Uh, if I can get over there, I will share with you Romans 8. And uh, uh, in verse... 17 Romans 8 17 it says if children then heirs heirs of God and join heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together with him and in verse 18 this is where we'll be this coming Sunday for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory uh, which shall be revealed in us so what kind of sufferings did Paul have and Paul wrote that. What kind of sufferings was he talking about? Well, I was beat with rods. I was I was I was imprisoned. I was beat with whips. You know, I uh, I was stoned. At least one time he was stoned. I think he was stoned twice. But uh, uh, so he he didn't get stoned because he was a Republican or a Democrat. He he got he got stoned because he was a Christian, a Christ follower. You see. And so that's that's what it's talking about over here with Peter, is is uh, we're going to suffer. So so look at the verse again. Look at chapter four, verse one and verse two. Uh, for as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind that we're what we're we're willing to suffer for Him and for each other. For He that has suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. Now, does that mean I quit sinning? No. What did we talk about Sunday? You know, I think it was Sunday. Maybe it was two Sundays ago. Um, we're, we're saved from how many sins? Right, right. 
So we're saved from our sins. So when it says I'm ceased from sinning, it don't mean that I quit sinning. It means that I have been saved. And this is a mark of being saved is people mark you out and they start attacking you. You see, we've got too comfortable in the church in America. We really have. And we don't want to suffer for Christ. We're, we've been spoilt here in the, in the South because we're in the Bible Belt, but it's getting, that Bible Belt's getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Do you know right here where we're at? It is considered one of the pockets of lostness in the United States. This area right here, our zip code right here, is considered one of the pockets of lostness. There's only about 30% of the people that live in this zip code, which is 30,000 people that live in this zip code, that consider themselves somewhat moderate Christians. That means 70% don't consider themselves moderate Christians. Most people don't even go to church or are not affiliated with the church anymore. That's why when you see people having funerals nowadays, it's they're down at a graveside or they're, uh, they're, they're not affiliated with the church. You know, there's not a pastor in there preaching because they don't know one. You know, um, you, if you don't know one, you don't know one. But that's our fault. That's our fault, man. It's our fault. We can't get tired of, uh, weary of, of doing well. We just can't. Um, Oh, me. Um, let's look at verse 2. It says, uh, That we no longer should live the rest of this time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. As a result, as a re- result of being adopted by Christ and by having adopted Christ's mindset, we've counted ourselves dead to sin. Now, we've talked about that for two weeks of the book of Romans. Uh, we, we counted ourselves dead to sin. We've died to sin. We've died to the sin in Christ. But we live the rest of our lives not with our evil human desires, but we're to live the rest of our life with a Christ desire, with His desire. That, that's the idea right there. To, to the will of God. Verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. For th- this time of our life may... Uh, suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banqueting, and abominable idolatries. Whereas they think it strange that we run not with them to the same excess of the right of speaking evil of you. So, verse 3, uh, in, in our past life, our, our old habits, uh, as as Paul as Peter, excuse me, is is stressing here our old habits. Uh, we did what pagans did because we were a pagan. We chose that kind of lifestyle. We wasted years, and I'm going to tell you, you're looking at somebody that wasted a lot of his years, okay, and a lot of his energy, and a lot of his time, a lot of his money. A lot of his health. You're you're looking at somebody. We wasted our time on debauchery, on lust, on drunkenness, on orgies, carousing, and idolatry. That's what the words actually are right there. And um, this 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 exhortation should have a strong impact on us as Christians uh, who used to live in gross sin. You know, oh, I'm I'm going to get in trouble right here. When 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 I made the decision to start going to church, I had a lot of friends that were saying. Y'all come to our church, man. You know, you can do this and you can do that. You can do the other. And, you know, they ain't nobody going to judge you and this, that, and the other. And, man, I was already judging me. I didn't, you know, I, 
<laughs> I didn't want to get in a place where I wasn't getting judged. I wanted to be in a place where somebody's going to try to hold me accountable. And the church that God drew us to was a strict independent Baptist church. It was it wasn't a church that was on the you know on the fringe of a year. It was a church that was strict. The, the, the people there were they lived a strict life. They 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 had codes that they and it wasn't a legalistic code. Some people would call them legalistic, but they were not legalistic. It was. I'm going to get as far away from sin as I possibly can. And and that was the that was what and one of the things that has that I have noticed. I don't know how many of you know Scott Jackson, but um, Scott Jackson, when he made a profession of faith, he went. He didn't try to find somewhere where he fit in. He went as far right as he could go. Man. He got as far away from everything as he could get away from. And I just find people that the 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 more wicked they considered themselves, the further to the right they go. If that makes sense, if that makes sense. And and so people that people that have lived in gross sin. Uh, Christianity has a big impact and it pushes them way away from that. And I think people that have lived a, a fairly good life, I don't think they get drove that far. If that, does that make sense? Does, am I talking in circles? Okay, maybe I am. I don't know. But uh, um, I just think, I think people that is way, way away away from God and they've done a lot of bad things I think that right right I, I think so too I think it's I want to get away from it as much as I can I know all these things influence me you know uh, we pick a lot in here about music and uh you know, I'm not going to bash you about whatever kind of music you you listen to. I know there's people that do, but uh, but music influences you, whether you want to believe that or not, uh, for good or bad. It uh, music has a message. Every song has a message, and I don't care whether you're talking about opera or whether you're talking about classical music. Beethoven, he had a message in his music. You better believe it. Tchaikovsky had a message in his music all the way to the day. Music has a message in it and, and um, it influences us, you know, but I, I think that again, people that was way, 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 I mean, they go way into other extreme, you know, as far as they go, man, we got to hurry. I'm not going to get the one paragraph here. Um, uh, anyway, verse three, for the, for the time past of our life, uh, may suffice us uh, to wrought the will of the Gentiles. In other words, ungodliness, paganism. Uh, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquets, uh, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it is strange that we run not with them in the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. Um, you know, I think that it's. I think it's, uh, if you ever seen anybody that was really bad and they made a profession of faith, those people that run with them, it won't be long, you'll be back with us. That's, and they're always trying to bring you back there. Um, when we, I used to drink a lot, a lot. And um, we went on a cruise right after we started going to church. And one of my cousins in particular, I mean, he just, the whole time, he just, he just, you want a beer, Marty? Come on, ain't nobody looking, man. Come on over here. Yeah. Man, you want one of these rum punches? You know, and, and I mean, it was, it, he, you, you have no idea all the things that he, he kept trying to get me into. 
But a year later, that same man got saved. See, he, he wanted to see if it was real there. And he got saved, and to this day, he serves in the church that he got saved in. I mean, he is he's a outstanding Christian, to be honest with you. But uh, but again, he he wanted to see if it was real. He wanted to test the water, see if it was real. They they think it's strange that we you know we're not running with them anymore. <coughs> they reject our gospel. They heap up abuse on us and abuse to themselves. Verse 5, who shall give an account? These same people are going to give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God uh, in the spirit. So, these people are ready to be judged. So as we're living our life, basically as we're living our life out in front of these people and, they're, and they think it's strange and they're watching us and some of them are actually ridiculing us and they're seeing what's happening, the gospel is being preached to them at the same time. And these people are dead. Do, do you realize that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever sat down in a restaurant? It's been a long time since I've done this, but I still remember doing this. Have you ever sat down in a restaurant? A full restaurant, a big restaurant, looked around. I said, I wonder how many of these people, if Christ returned right now, would go to hell. Have you ever thought about that? You see, People that don't know Jesus Christ while they're breathing and they're functioning, they're dead. They're as, they're as good as in hell. We, we read that out of John 3. They're condemned already. You don't have to do anything. They're already condemned. They're already dead. And our life is preaching to them. And so when we allow ourselves to suffer for the cause of Christ, I'm not talking about people just walk all over you for every reason in the world. Uh, you know, Rankin, how about let me borrow your tools? Well, you know the, the sorry joker is going to go up here and sell them at, at the end of Kivet Street up there, you know. I mean, he, he you know it. He's done it to you before. Well, you don't, you don't just... Oh, okay, it's all right. This time, you, you've got to judge people by what they've done in the past to you, too, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. That's not suffering for the cause of Christ. That's just being ignorant, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's just being ignorant. Uh, uh, suffering for the cause of Christ is when people are ridiculing you because of your lifestyle, because of your testimony. I really want to get into the next part of this thing. Everybody's going to give an account for God. Everybody. Even the people that are now dead, they're going to give an account to God. Now this is not going back, you know, we 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 dealt with chap the end of chapter 3 last week and you know again that that misinterpretation of going down into the uh hell and preaching and giving these people a second opportunity. That's not the op that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about preaching to those that are presently presently dying, those that are presently dead. Okay? So we got to put it in the right place. Man. Let's deal with verse 7 and and we'll stop with there. But this is this is changing this is changing gears. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Peter gives us three things in this verse right here. And we're going to end with these three things. He gives us a motivation. He says, to the end of all things is hand. As we talked about earlier, I don't know that what's going on in, in Ukraine and Russia is leading us up to the rapture of the church. But it definitely 
is a piece of the puzzle that could be going into place that will open the door for future events to take place. Let me say this. God is supernatural, is He not? He can do anything He chooses to do. Can He not? He can do miracles, right? The miracle of speaking the universe into existence. In six days, he created all that is seen by mankind. Okay, everything. In six days, literal 24-hour days, and he didn't even need all that. Okay, he, did, he just did that so we could have a pattern to go by. He did the miracle of the flood. He, he, he did the miracle of um, Sarah having a baby at 90 years old. The miracles in Egypt. The miracles of the virgin birth. The miracles that Jesus did through the power of God because He is God uh, during His life here on earth. The fact that He was resurrected. God can do miracles, okay? I believe that. But God chooses more times than not to work inside of the natural laws that He is bound this universe with. And do you know what that does? That gives him more glory because he's bringing things about in a natural way. Okay? Let me just ride with me just a second here. My kids are at home. I get my belt out and I get a I get a stick and a yard stick and, and I just I just beat them and beat them and beat them. Clean up this house. Clean up this house. And I just around and I'm just beating them every which way. Well, I'm bigger than they are. And they're going to get tired of getting spanked. They're going to clean up the house. Well, what does that prove? It just proves I got power. Okay. But if my kids get off the school bus and they say it would please our parents if we clean up, we clean up the kitchen, we vacuum the floor or whatever because they've asked us to do that. And they do that because I've asked them to do that. That shows a whole lot more about my parenting skills and a whole more, a whole lot more about my children's love towards me and their respect towards me. Well, when God brings things about in a natural way, it shows that He is in control because He spoke it 3,000 years ago. Okay? More times than not, he brings things about in a natural way. And so this could, what's going on over there with Russia and Ukraine, and, and if you've seen this, they're talking about um, Moldova now. And, and I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of other stuff on the table over there right now. And it would, it would allow the bear to have that peninsula to go right over into the Middle East. Uh, again, and I know they've had it in the past, but I'm, I'm saying again. All right. But even at that, the motivation should be the time is at hand. The end time is at hand. And if you believe like I believe, we got to say there's just there can't be much more time left with all of the perversion going on, all of the perversion of God's Word, all of the things that we see, I don't believe we're seeing prophecy fulfilled before our eyes, but we actually are. We're seeing all the pieces being put into place. It ought to motivate us. Second, it says, be sober. Verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober. That's a mindset. We need to think soberly. It don't mean that I, I'm, I'm not drunk. It means I need to think soberly, like somebody that my mind is clear. And we need to think soberly about the events going on around us. We need to think soberly about the decisions that we need to make, what we're going to do, and that kind of stuff. And then the third thing is this. Look at verse 7 again. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The mandate. There's a motivation. The end is at hand. There's a mindset. Be sober. And there's a mandate, watch unto prayer. We need to be praying and we need to be watching for the answer of prayer. 
we need, there needs to be one eye on the sky because we're supposed to do what? Look up, our redemption draweth nigh. But at the same time, we need to be in prayer and we need to be looking for God to answer those prayers and see how he's working in around us. Even when we're suffering, even when people are persecuting us, we need to be saying, well, God's probably working in somebody's heart or life and I need to keep an eye on who it is, Lord, open my eyes to that. Open my eyes to how I might be a witness to somebody. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. All right. We will come back. We will pick it up in verse 7 next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, well, God, we want to thank you for this day. And I thank you for the opportunity again to be here tonight with these folks and to be on the internet. We thank you for Ethan making that happen. Father, we do pray for Laramie and his family. We forgot to do that earlier. We just ask that you uh, help them to be okay and the things that are going on there. Uh, Father, I do ask that just like in verse 7 that you give us the, the right mindset, the right motivation. Lord, I, I just I ask that you give us the mandate that we're, we're doing what we need to do is we, we see time as what we think is wrapping up. Father, again, we do pray that you be with the leaders of this world right now. Father, we pray that you'll help them to put their pride aside and to look at the suffering and the bloodshed. God, I pray that uh, you'll bring a peaceful end, a swift peaceful end soon before this thing escalates anymore. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.